on today's World Inside. Big efforts to bring COVID infections in the port city of Tianjin and Hanan province's Zhengzhou under control, with containment measures in Xi'an paying off as cases drop. What do these efforts mean ahead of China's Spring Festival holiday? And Hong Kong has just worn in its 7th Legislative Council. Will this lead Hong Kong in a new and more progressive direction? They all support one country, two systems. They all want Hong Kong to, to flourish. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World the Insight. I'm Tian Wei. China will test the entire populations of major cities Tianjin and Zhengzhou after over a dozen COVID cases were identified. This follows a lockdown in the city of Xi'an, which now has over 1,900 cases. Many believe China's zero COVID approach has borne fruit as cases in Xi'an begin to drop. What do COVID cases around China mean as China's spring travel rush is under a month away and the Winter Olympic Games is just around the corner? Let's ask experts. For more on the latest on COVID-19, joining us in Washington, D.C., Kate Tulanko, CEO of Corvus Health in New Haven, Xi Chen, Associate Professor of Health Policy and Economics from Yale School of Public Health, in Nanjing, Wu Jiwei, Director from the Center for Public Health Research with Medical School of Nanjing University. Welcome to the program. Now, Kate, to you first, the COVID-19 especially Omicron, seem to be the large majority of the cases taking place in U.S. right now. Do we see any date that is likely to peak? My guess is that it'll probably peak in early February because many schools are just coming back now into session. And I think that Omicron is going to go quite rapidly through the U.S. schools. Children will bring it home to their families. So we, we still have that peak about two to three weeks out. Mm. How are we seeing about the severe cases and also hospitalizations among the latest wave? What's likely to be the case? Well, with COVID, it's a numbers game. And with Delta, you had fewer people infected, but those infected had more severe disease. With Omicron, you have many more people infected. In fact, about two weeks ago, it's estimated that one in every 100 Americans had COVID that week. So it, you're having many more people with COVID. So just by, by risk analysis, mm. more people are going to fall ill, more high risk people are gonna catch COVID. And so once again, you're seeing hospitals overwhelmed. Now the death toll in most communities has been lower, but the hospitalizations you know, are high. And very interestingly, this past week, the US insurance, life insurance company uh, companies released the fact that all death in uh, working adults in the U.S., 18 to 65 has increased 40 percent during the, the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's either that people are having trouble accessing health care, they're dying of COVID uh, in the short term or the long term, sort of this post-COVID inflammatory yeah. uh, period, they're having more uh, heart attacks and strokes. But a 40 percent higher mortality rate is quite significant. We have already seen some latest uh, incidents in Tianjin, for example, uh, that the community transmission that is taking place right now uh, are actually related to Omicron. Earlier, there was some sense of cautiousness about whether Omicron is already in China. Uh, Professor Wu, what do you make of the latest uh, development? Uh, I think the Omicron cases in China will not uh, will be inevitable because uh, we identify a number of cases in, in various different cities. And uh, in view of the uh, highly contagious nature of the virus, uh, whatever you do, uh, you may delay the virus from spreading, but it, it eventually it will establish infections. And the Tianjin case is a good example of that. Um, in the school clusters, uh, you know, all the break, uh, clearly that the virus has established itself somewhere, although we don't know exactly how the virus was introduced and transmitted, but still uh, we have no information who is the primary cases and who are the secondary cases. But mm. this is a good question that we need to look into. 
Mm. Now, we know that uh, there are going to be new vaccines. Uh, there are going to be new treatment pills in this year, 2022, because it, it works that way. Uh, usually, when it is the third year, a lot of things picked up. So can we expect something more capable and much more powerful in dealing with COVID-19. Oral pills by Merck and Pfizer will make a big difference because previously the only you know, treatment that could be given outpatient was IV. And so it had to be done in, in special clinics. But as the saying goes, you can't treat your way out of a pandemic. The prevention has to be the foundation of all of our strategies. And if you look globally, China has been the only country that has been able to do testing on a mass scale. In the US, we still aren't able to test enough people. And mm. you know, as has been suggested, you know, every American family should be able to test themselves once or twice a week. It's just not possible. So we need to increase production of testing kits and also increase production of the vaccines even though in uh, you know, China, North America, and Europe, most people who wanted to get vaccinated have gotten vaccinated. Still, the majority of the world, most people have not even gotten a single vaccine. Mm. Treatment pills, vaccines, as well as testing, all these are important tools for all of us. But Professor Wu, there's another question, maybe another fortune telling question. With the speed of Omicron, we already see how transmittable a variant could be for COVID-19. And it is hard to say we're not going to have even more transmittable uh, variant in the future or variants in the future. So Professor Wu, the question really is, before we got these tools, definitely going to be able to support us. Are we going to also have, unfortunately, herd immunity eventually? Well, actually, the herd immunity is a very tricky question. Um, whether herd immunity will prevent us from being infected or not, uh, it's, uh, it's a good question. Right. You know, we do have a historical uh, experience that uh, once you uh, build up herd immunity, you may be protected, but it's very much uh, virus dependent. And the problem, it's the circumstances dependent because the modern life is very different from the past. So I think that the best bet is that we have to develop effective vaccines or universal vaccines and therapeutic uh, uh, approach as well as plus public health uh, measures to prevent the pandemic. I think we shouldn't uh, purely rely on the so-called uh, herd immunity. What we have seen is that although in some countries the vaccination rate is pretty high, but still we do get infections. Once the new virus came, then basically uh, uh, we, we become highly susceptible. The Winter Olympics is going to take place in a few weeks in Beijing and Zhang Jiakou, a city close to Beijing. This is a time when Omicron, a very contagious and very transmittable variant of uh, COVID-19 taking place around the world, sweeping around the world. So, uh, uh, Chen, tell me more about your sense about how challenging the work might be, given China is uh, still holding dear the uh, zero tolerance of COVID-19 policy. Yeah, indeed, it's very challenging, especially the flu season and uh, the most recent the Tianjin outbreak. Uh, so Tianjin is very close to Beijing, and it's also very much approaching uh, Spring Festival. People are traveling, and the transmissibility of the Omicron variant could present a, a new level of danger, especially to the Olympic Games. So the closed loop management of this uh, uh, the game is very important to make sure that uh, people are in the Olympic Games are having no direct contact with the outside world. So that management is really challenging and uh, uh, the regulators and the governments. Mm -hmm. But I think more and more uh, things are being arranged. For example, just a couple of hours ago, I saw news that uh, uh, Beijing's uh, transportation agencies was uh, discussing how to avoid being a direct contact between the buses, the transportation right. facilities uh, that carry the uh, the uh, the players 
with uh, the Beijing residents. Mm. If there is, a, for example, a traffic jam or even a, a, a car accident, how to make sure that there is no direct contact? So I mm. think those very nuanced, detailed management are very important. When you look at what happened in the Japanese Olympics, fewer than 500 people tested positive for COVID, and most of those were Japanese. Olympic staff who got it from the Japanese community rather than from the Olympians. So I, I don't expect there to be large breakouts during the, the Beijing Olympics, but we do need to keep in mind that all of the athletes will be coming in from countries with higher COVID rates than China. So we can expect some outbreaks uh, and, and the, you know, sort of the worst case scenario would be outbreaks uh, associated with the Olympics combined with people moving around for the, the spring festival. But um, you know, certainly, if any country can, uh, you know, test all the athletes, get the logistics right, uh, it will be China. So I, I, I'm not concerned uh, about the Olympics. I, I would certainly recommend that there not be spectators. I don't think that is a good idea. Or if they do have spectators, that there only be very few and that they be widely spaced out. Mm. There are a lot of unknowns at this point. Nobody knows the situations, uh, how this round of uh, Omicron is likely to go. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Tulenko, uh, from your own sense, uh, we heard earlier uh, that uh, from the WHO uh, head, very likely the year 2022 will see the so-called end of the crisis stage of the COVID-19 worldwide. Now. I don't know whether that's too optimistic for you, but you know, how would people go along with their life? It's already two years. Well, I think there are several ways that we can define a, a crisis. And, and to me, in, in a way, the most important is the overwhelming of the hospitals. Because when hospitals are overwhelmed, it means many people are dying and also people cannot access regular medical care. Uh, and I would see that probably in 2022, that will indeed die down, that we won't have those hospitals overwhelmed because more people will be vaccinated or more people will have natural immunity from having caught COVID. Uh, and, and also that the hospitals will be able to eventually hire more staff uh, and, and, and be more prepared uh, than they were in the past two years. But as far as, you know, stores opening, closing and borders, you know, being opened or closed, I expect most of that to normalize as well. I do think we will see more variants this year. For example, in Cyprus, they just found a new variant that combines uh, genetics from Delta with Omicron. So there's a concern that maybe it's as infectious as Omicron and as deadly as, as Delta. Uh, so I do expect more waves, but I, I think life will normalize because uh, people now know how to handle themselves. They know, now know how to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and with both the natural immunity and the, the vaccine immunity, we'll see fewer, you know, fewer uh, cities in crisis. Mm. Many of us agree that uh, public health is political because it involves so many people's well-being and health and their lives. Uh, and uh, we all know that public health is also a balancing art. So we should balance uh, our population health as well as economic and social activities. So making the balance. So, so laying flat is, of course, uh, one of the worst decisions. So I think since we already have so many effective tools at our disposal, and the three key things, if we do that, and we can balance uh, our uh, the public population health and uh, economic and social well-being, the first is maintaining stringent public health measures as China have been doing. Second is reaching as high as possible the level of uh, uh, immunity at the population level. And the third is to prepare the health system uh, to cure the disease associated with uh, COVID-19 as well as other disease to make sure there's no major crowd out. Uh, I think you know, uh, we need a multi-pronged approach to deal with it because uh, uh, we know that vaccine has its limitation Therapeutic drugs uh, ha have its limitation, and the public health approach also have its limitations. So my, my bottom line is that we need to combine all those threes. 
and make the best use of all the current available tools to deal with the virus. Uh, such as the vaccine will provide the first uh, line of defense. And once you have a breakthrough infections, when people develop a severe, severe cases, which will be much smaller numbers, mm. then they will be treated by drugs. Uh, I think, you know, uh, by uh, doing this, uh, we will be able to deal with the virus. Uh, thank you so much, uh, the three of you, for joining us. Things are ever evolving and we'll certainly have more times and possibilities to knock on your door, ask for your expertise. Thank you, really appreciate that. Kate Tolenko, Xi Chen, Wu Ju Wei. Thank you.